Amen. Today we are, last week we began looking at the song of Christmas, our series for this month. We're looking at, we looked at uh, the song, Black Lives Song, we looked at Luke chapter 1. This Sunday, we're going to focus our attention on Luke chapter 2. We're going to look at the angels, the angelic song coming from chapter 2 of Luke's gospel today. If you have your Bibles, turn me to Luke chapter 2. We're going to do a survey of those 21 verses first. Then we're going to look particularly at the song itself and pull out about three or four principles, things that we want you to uh, take note of. The virgin birth is perhaps one of the most difficult doctrines for individuals to grab a hold of. Most individuals today understand uh, <coughs> that he was a good teacher, he uh, was a prophet, may not understand and accept all of his miracles, but the general premise is that he uh, did some good deeds. Uh, what most people get hung up on is the fact of the virgin birth. That whole concept uh, cannot be understood uh, without the power of the Holy Spirit. And even with the power of the Holy Spirit, we just simply accept it as being what it is, coming from the Word of God, so it becomes fact. Uh, but this second chapter of Luke uh, gives us the account of the entrance of God into the earth realm through the birth of Jesus. And uh, this promised Messiah, the Savior, who would bring salvation to all people um, comes into this, this earth realm. As we look at verses 1 through 21 um, in the first part of our sermon today, um, two things I want us to take note of as we go through the survey here. How God works through history, how he uses history in his plan, he uses governments, he uses government policies in his plans, and he uses anonymous people uh, like the shepherds that are going to be in our text today. He uses common anonymous people to accomplish his saving purposes. He works through history. He works through government policies to bring about his ultimate goal, the ultimate plan. And in our lesson, he's going to use government to bring about salvation by, by allowing people to be in certain places at certain times in order that Jesus will be born and bring fulfillment to Scripture. But he uses places in history. This is a historical uh, fact that we will encounter in our lesson today. So if you have your Bible, go to chapter 2. And um, we began by noticing, first of all, the change from chapter 1 to chapter 2. Uh, Luke changes the scene quickly. We leave chapter 1 with the prophecy of the song coming from Zechariah. And, but he quickly and radically changes. We go away from uh, an isolated Jordan wilderness to now we're in the Senate in the seat of Rome. Uh, we go from um, a general setting um, in which Zechariah prophesies concerning the ministry of Je Jesus and how this young man continues to grow and become strong in spirit and how he lives in a desert until his public ministry. And we go, we find ourselves 
uh, in a setting that will lend itself to the birth of Jesus Christ. And this is put into the framework of world history. This is put into the framework of world history, making this a historical event, an historical framework. Now, modern uh, historians have a problem with trying to recreate this historical framework. Um, they can give us the list of governors in Syria around the time of Jesus' birth. They can give us an approximate time of the birth of Christ between 4 B.C. and 6 B.C. They know that. Uh, they, know, they know that certain people were in place uh, when Jesus was born according to what's given in Scripture. Their problem lies in whether or not the census really happened, that the census that is talked about in the first part of Luke take place, um, um, going back looking at great Jewish historians like Josephus and other historians of that time, they question, they uh, 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 are not solid on that. For us, the believer is not so much to know the exact person or the exact time or the exact place where this event took place. We simply take it by faith. We take it by faith because it is in the Word of God. So Luke begins by saying, Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. Now, history does tell us that there was a Caesar by the name of Augustus. Uh, uh, there are records of Caesar Augustus. The problem comes in, is, did he give out such a decree? We know that these decrees were given out by Roman uh, Caesars uh, very frequently because they wanted to know how many individuals were in their providence? How many individuals were under their dictatorship so that they know how much taxes to receive? And so that they could prepare their budgets. They could prepare what work needed to be done. Very much on the, uh, on, on the same scale as the census in the United States, I believe, will be given next, next year to know how much federal money go to certain counties and, and uh, 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 which will provide certain projects uh, uh, for certain ethnic groups of people. So it was on those particular guidelines that Caesar Augusta does this. So it says, a census be taken of all who inhabit the earth. Now we know we're not talking literally earth. Because at this time, Rome was not ruled over the literal earth. But it is talking about all that Rome had control over, which at that particular point in time, they had the largest rulership of any other uh, empire before them. Their territorial rule was larger than Alexander the Great. It was larger than the Babylonians. It was larger than the Egyptians, it was larger than the Assyrians. All of the other major world powers up until Rome, theirs was much smaller. Rome uh, had uh, three-fourths of Europe, uh, one-third of the tip of Northern Africa, all of the Middle East, and so they had the largest geographical area of any of the, of any of the empires proceeding up to Jesus. So a census is taken. How many people are in our, under our rulership? What are the occupations? How much money they make? So that they would know how much taxes would come in. Um, um, so verse 2 says, this was, this was the first census taken while Aquinas was governor of Syria. Now, we know that there was an individual by this name. Now, if you go and research history, we'll question whether or not this individual made a census. It's hard to tell, but we know that there was an individual by this name. Verse 3 says, And everyone was on his way to register 
for the census. Now, you had to go back to the town of your birth. You had to go back to where you were born and register. This is how the census would be taken. Now, for me, I would have to go back to Gary, Indiana, where I was born, for the census to be legit. And so they all are going back to their original birthplaces. Uh, and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the family of David. Now, you see Joseph introduced again. He was first introduced to us in chapter 1, verse 27, is where he enters the scene. And it is the issue of taxation that's going to allow us to go a little bit into his lineages. So he is traveling about 90 miles to Bethlehem, which was the home of King David, uh, where the scripture said that the Messiah would be born, <coughs> according to Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. And so we see Joseph and, and, and the information that's given to us allow us to be able to trace his family tree to David. Joseph does not make the trip alone. He's with somebody. Who he's with, he's with Mary. Uh, Mary, uh, uh, they are engaged. They have not been properly married yet. They are engaged. But Mary is pregnant. And so she joins him for the trip. Uh, because most importantly, the males had to make the census. Uh, the women, they didn't really count that much as being a full citizen anyway. So it was the males who had to register. And um, um, she's maybe about 14 or 15. These are young people. But they had to register for the census in order to pay taxes. Luke also surprises us with his next statement, uh, just as the event must have surprised Mary and Joseph. Uh, uh, Jesus' appearance is upon us. Uh, Joseph also went from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. Verse 6, while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. In other words, her time of, 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 of caring uh, of this child, nine months, had come to completion. Um, she gives birth to her firstborn child, a son. And following the practice and custom of her day, Scripture tells us that Mary would wrap the baby in strips of cloth. The purpose for wrapping the baby in strips of cloth were to keep the arms and the legs straight, keep them straight, and so that they would not be damaged. Um, it also tells us that Jesus' first crib was usually, uh, uh, was nothing of the normal of that day. Well, we understand it was used for the dining table of animals as he was laid in a manger. Um, and he is laid out. <coughs> There's a lot more information that I'm not going to give to you today, but um, to help us to understand, as some scriptures say, it's in, they went to an inn. Okay, I don't want you to understand that like a motel. It wasn't an inn like we know. Uh, um, this was during the time of the Passover, and what this term is really referring to was an extra room in somebody's house. Because everybody who went would stay with somebody who lived in Jerusalem. And what they were unable to find was um, an extra room. Now, we know that they had had room already because they had been in Jerusalem for a few days. They had already been there for a few days. As we saw him over in chapter 1, they had been there and for some reason 
um, they need another location and they can't find a, a, a room or proper place for them to be. The next paragraph uh, begins in verse number 8. In verse number 8, once again, Luke is going to shift the scenes from the <coughs> baby Jesus lying where animals eat uh, 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 and where we will see the entrance of our anonymous messengers, our shepherds, our shepherds come on the scene. The shepherds' business had changed dramatically by the time Jesus comes on the scene. During the time of David, uh, we understand David was a shepherd. When David was a shepherd, being a shepherd was pretty much a family business. It was something one did as a family. Well, it has properly changed now. And now being a shepherd at the time that Jesus is born is a despised occupation. Uh, many shepherds were accused of uh, robbery and using um, land that they had no rights for. Shepherding was also known to be a very lonely occupation, and particularly at nighttime. And because a shepherd had to stay alert, he had to be awake, he had to be on watch, he made sure that while the sheep were sleeping, um, no, no predators, no wild beasts would come up and take advantage over them. So he makes a shift and brings in the shepherds in the same region, the region where Joseph and Mary are. In the same region, there are some shepherds staying out in the field. What are they doing? They're keeping watch over their flock by night. And number nine, and an angel of the Lord suddenly, suddenly stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terribly afraid. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. Lying in a manger. So the scene shifts uh, uh, down from the earth, from Mary and Joseph, from shepherds. It shifts, it shifts from these lowly shepherds who are enduring a dark, lonely night, and now it shifts to heaven. And from heaven we see these glorious messengers, these angels. They come with God's glory. They come with God's glory. Glory to God. It's not the glory of God, but they come with God, bringing God glory. Notice how it is described as being a shining, <coughs> majestic, uh, a, a great glow about them that would cause those who saw it to operate in wonder. Um, we see, we remember when, uh, when Isaiah the prophet, when he came into the very presence of God, it caused him to fall to his knees. Uh, the same thing in Zachariah's song, in Mary's song, uh, uh, these presence of God when he makes himself known is not such a normal uh, occurrence and it causes those to witness it to be in awe in gazing at this glorious uh, uh, example of God terrified the shepherds. And, and, and they being terrified brought an immediate response from these angels. And what did they say? They simply said, do not be afraid. Why? Because the gospel is coming. The good news is coming. The gospel is coming. And when the gospel comes, it brings joy. It brings happiness. It brings joy 
not fear. So joy has come as a result of the good news. The good news. And so these angels bring about this message to these lowly earthen uh, uh, workers. Verses 13 to 14, the word of God reads, um, <coughs> And suddenly there appeared with an angel a multitude of the heavenly host. So an angel comes and speaks first, and then with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly host. Heavens open up, and there's more than just the angel. And what are they doing? They are praising God. Now this is the, the song of the angels. They say, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Now, notice this song really only have two stanzas. The first stanza simply says, glory to God in the highest. Giving glory, giving praise, giving uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the right applause, giving the right significance, giving it to whom? Giving it to God. Which God? To the God in the highest. The God is identified. Where is he? He is in the highest, the highest of the heavens, highest of the three heavens, giving glory to God, Elohim, glory to God, praise to Elohim, who is above all other gods in the highest. And the second stanza says, and on earth peace among men. Why? Because God incarnate has come and he is in the form of a baby with whom he is pleased. And then we find the scene shifts again from heaven and as the angels are singing, and when the angels had gone away from them, that is the shepherds, had gone into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem, the city of David, let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. Now notice their response to the supernatural. Their response is an immediate response. So let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. They leave their sheep to go and make known to what the angels had said. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. And when they had seen this, they made known the statement which, they, which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, but they didn't go back to say. They went glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. What the angel and the heavenly host had proclaimed to them, remember the angel told them, uh, uh, back in verse number 11 for today in the city of David which is Bethlehem there has been born for you a savior who is Christ the Lord mm -hmm. this will be a sign for you and you will find a baby wrapped in cloth lying in a manger when they go to the city of David which is Bethlehem they find this baby as exactly what the angel had told them and so they come looking, but they go back glorifying. They come with expectation and finding what God has said is true, that his word has come to pass, they go back giving God glory and praising God. Why are they praising God? They're praising God for all that they had heard from the angels and all that they had seen and verified what God had said, just as they had been told. So, in these 21 verses, I want you to note several things. We got uh, the Savior's in earthly birth from verses 1 through 21. 
Uh, it should be on your outline. Do you have point A, the earthly occasion? Yes. Yeah, okay, let's go through that real quickly. All right, survey. The earthly occasion was the Roman taxation. Roman taxation. All right, verses 1 through 3. Letter B is the heavenly destination. The heavenly destination. The heavenly destination. All right, letter C was the secluded birth. The secluded birth. The secluded birth. Letter D was the heavenly announcement of the good news. The heavenly announcement of the good news. Remember, one angel come first, and then a multitude of, of, of the heavenly angels, a multitude of the angels come and, and speak. And then uh, number five, there is um, the heavenly praise for <laughs> earthly peace. The heavenly <laughs> praise for earthly peace. And then letter F is the earthly visit to the heaven's child when the, when the shepherds leave their flock and come to meet Jesus, the baby. And then letter G is the earth witness to the heavenly child. And then letter H, the earthly rites bring heaven's name. All right, that's a survey of these 21 verses. Our lesson today centers around the good news that's brought by these angels. And what is the good news? The good news is that a Savior <clears throat> was born for you. And the Savior is Christ. <clears throat> Christ the Lord. A survey was taken uh, uh, some years ago where a good number of professing Christians were asked the question, who will go to heaven? Uh, a good number of Christians were at, uh, professing Christians were asked this question. And the report, which was a part of Moody Magazine, <coughs> reported that 49% of professing Christians agree that all good people, whether they consider Jesus Christ to be Savior or not, if they're good, they will go to heaven when they die. Now, if that opinion is true, then the story of the birth of Jesus may warm some people's hearts and may make some people feel good. But it won't be the best news in the world. News that an individual can live without. But if the Bible is correct in stating that all people have sinned and that apart from Christ that they are under God's wrath, then the news that a Savior has been born is hardly just nice. It's the best news in the world. And it is absolutely critical and crucial that we understand it being the best news and why it is the best news. And to help us to understand that, five aspects of this text I want us to look at. And we already looked at several, but here's number one. The good news about Christ the Savior is historically true. It's historically true. Now, it needs to really be emphasized today because there are so many legends that hang around Christmas. So much, so much information. They got nothing to do with the birth of Christ. We talk more about Santa Claus. We, we, we talk about mistletoe. We, uh, 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 so many things that are intertwined with the, the story of, of Christ's interest into the world, into the earth, that is lumped together with the birth of Christ. And they forget that the birth of Christ was reported in the Bible as being a part of history. This is why Luke gives us that account in verses 1 and 2 by giving us the names of those government officials and what they were doing, why they were doing what they were doing. Uh, because this is a historical, a historical event that happened. 
So point number one, the good news about Christ the Savior is historically true. Here's number two. The good news about Christ the Savior is simply based upon his unique person. Him being a unique person. The angel stated this plainly in verse number 11. If you got your Bibles open, look, look clearly at verse number 11. Jesus, born of the Virgin Mary, is the Savior, common, who is Christ, which in Hebrew is the word is Messiah, or the Anointed One, the Lord. Now, let's look at him being called Savior. There are a couple things that I want you to understand with him being Savior. First of all, he's fully man. He's fully man. He was born in the city of David to the descendants of David who were to register for their, for their taxes. That's pretty human. Joseph probably had some negative words to say about making a 90 mile trip a three day trip just to register so he could pay his taxes. Uh, but it's interesting that God who was sovereign, how he used the Roman emperor's tax edict to get Joseph and Mary to the prophesied birthplace. This was prophesied in the book of Micah that he would be born in Bethlehem. But he used the government Amen. and a government edict to get him to where he needed to be. Amen. I want you to simply know that God's providence is always at work. Amen. God's providence is always at work. In our government, in our relationship, God's providence is always at work. He set things up for his plan. Amen. God uses the Roman emperor's tax either to get Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem in order to fulfill prophecy. God sovereignly arranged that there wouldn't be a room for them nowhere. There wouldn't be any special privileges given for this baby, even though this baby was God. Hmm. They laid him in a feeding trough. Contrary to popular Christmas carols, this baby did cry. Jesus did cry. There was no halo around his head. It was a baby. And what the shepherds saw was a wrinkled, newborn human baby. Jesus the Savior assumes full humanity from its very conception. Why? So that he might bear the sins of the human race. Jesus is fully man. Then number two, he's fully God. The angels told the shepherds that this one who had been born in Bethlehem was Christ the Lord. You got to understand the title here. You got to understand the title in light of its use in the Old Testament and especially in light of its context in Luke. In the Old Testament, the word Lord is clearly used to represent God. They used it instead of using the word Yahweh. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Luke uses the same word in verse number 9 where it says that the angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. He uses it again in verse 23 to refer to the law of the Lord and, and holy, holy to the Lord. The word means something different in verse number 11. Then it used in verse number 9 and 23. Luke would have clarified it. The Savior had to be a man to bear the sins of humans. 
but he had to be also God so that his sacrifice would merit before the holy throne of the almighty God. Only Jesus could do this. This is what makes him a very unique savior. What makes him unique is that he's fully man to bear the sins of human mankind and he's fully God to appease God Almighty. Amen. He is very unique. <coughs> he's the Savior. The Savior is the Christ. The word Christ is Messiah. Messiah is the word in Hebrew. And the word Christ is the word Messiah in Greek. And it means the anointed one. It refers to Jesus as the anointed king and priest who brings God's salvation to his people. In the Old Testament, the only two offices uh, 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 that were anointed were the kings and the high priests. Uh, 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 but this messianic expectation centers around the king aspect. As we study this in Psalms 2, the title of Christ especially focuses on the fact that Jesus is the one who will fulfill all Old Testament prophecy about the promised Messiah. He's the Savior. This Savior is the Christ. And finally, I want you to note that this one was born is the Savior. The definite article, Savior. What does this imply? <laughs> that those that he came to save were indeed lost. Those that he came to save were indeed alienated from God. And they were under God's just wrath. They were under God's just combination because of their sins. And what Jesus saves us from is the awful wrath of God. What Jesus saves us from is the awful punishment of God. The term also implies that we were helpless, that we could do nothing. Man could do nothing to save himself. Man could do nothing to bring himself under God justifiably. So we needed outside intervention. We needed outside intervention that could identify with the sins of humankind, but also could have other earthly powers to satisfy God, the Creator. We needed Jesus, and Jesus alone provides this kind of salvation. So the combination of these terms, Him being Savior, Him being the Christ, Him being the Lord, these titles all give attributes to Jesus as being the highest possible person who could satisfy the claims of God, which makes him a very special person. Don't allow anyone to put anybody in the class of Jesus. Amen. He stands in the class all by himself. Amen. They can talk about Buddha, they can talk about Mohammed, they can talk about Smith, they can talk about Redifor, they can talk about all of these who have supposedly started religion. But they cannot stand in the same class with Jesus. Jesus is the only one where all of these terms are applicable. And the good news is that this person, this news that this good person has been born He's coming to the earth's realm to fulfill his purpose. Here's, here's interesting point number three. The good news about Christ the Savior is for all people. And especially the common people. The common person. I wonder have you ever considered why the story doesn't say down there were in the same region scribes and Pharisees keeping watch over their scrolls and religious rituals. Or there were kings and princesses keeping watch over their treasures at the palace. God purposefully chose to reveal the birth of the Savior to simple shepherds who were going about their duties. But why shepherds? God chose shepherds to show that, number one, the good news is for all people and not just for the elite. 
the good news is for all people. As Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 29, Consider your calling, brethren, that there are not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not, that he might nullify the things that are, that no man should boast before God. <laughs> If the gospel was a complicated philosophy that required years of graduate study and for an individual to have a very high IQ in order to understand, then those who would attain it could boast that I know the gospel because of my intelligence. If the gospel required great sums of money or high social standing to attain. There would be no hope then for the poor and the lowly. But the beauty of the gospel, the beauty of the good news is that even uneducated, <laughs> illiterate, tribal men can understand that they are sinners and that they have a need for someone to intervene for them. Amen. God has made it so that all men are without excuse. Yes. That their Savior is Jesus. Yes. And by God's grace, if they believe, no matter what their educational status is, their financial status is, their, uh, 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 their mental status is, they can be saved. Mm -hmm. The good news also involves the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. It is, it is likely that the very sheep these men were tending in the fields that night were being prepared for the slaughter that would take place at the Passover in Jerusalem. Thus it becomes very symbolic that the shepherds were watching Passover lambs which would be allowed to come into Bethlehem to be viewed for the lambs that would be used to allow the sinners to be right with God. And in God's perfect justice, God has declared that the wages of sin is death, but in his love and mercy, God has provided the very penalty that his justice demanded. Mm -hmm. The entire Jewish sacrificial system pointed ahead to Jesus Christ, who is the perfect sin bearer, who offered himself as the acceptable substitute for sinners. If you trust in him as your sin bearer, then God transfers your guilt to him and his perfect righteousness back to you. So the good news involved the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. Also the good news provided us with a good shepherd. God has always had a special place in his heart for shepherds. You have to go back. Abraham was a shepherd. Isaac was a shepherd. Jacob was shepherds. King David was a shepherd. All of these men were called from tending the sheep to shepherd God's people. David was a type of a promised descendant who would reign on the throne, who would be said of himself, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. David was a type of Jesus. So God reveals his Savior to these simple shepherds to draw us and to show us that his good news is for all people. His good news is for the common people. It involves the sacrifice of the Lamb of God as well as provide us with a good shepherd. And the good news also is about the Christ being light and then fear and then joy. If you look at the events that we just read, they happened to these shepherds on this night. It was symbolic that what happens, it happens to every person who responds to the good news of Christ the Savior. Notice the order that it happened. First of all, these individuals, they are sitting and they are sitting at night. They are sitting in the darkness of the Judean night. Coming immediately after Zechariah's prophecy that the sunrise from on high will shine upon those who sit in darkness. Notice that's verse 79 of chapter 1. <clears throat> and so what do we see in the beginning of chapter 2? We see individuals 
who are sitting in literal darkness, Amen. who's about to experience the light of God. And the story of the shepherds keeping watch over their flock by night, I believe is more than just coincidence. It shows a fulfillment of God's promise. Their sitting out in that black night is a picture of every human heart without the Savior. We all at one time were sitting in darkness. We all were sitting at one time in the shadow of death. And then suddenly, there's a great flash of light. The angel of the Lord stood before these shepherds and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. It was as if a prolonged lightning flash lit up the night sky. But it was only for them to see. It was only for those shepherds to see. So for them, it was more than just a physical event. It symbolized what happens to every person when the Holy Spirit illuminates within our darkened hearts and illuminates the light of the gospel. God lights us up. He lit us up. Yes, Lord. We were once blind, but all of a sudden we could see. Amen. At one time it made no sense. Now there's a little understanding. As Isaiah the prophet wrote, the people who walked in darkness will see a great light. And those who live in a dark land, the light will shine upon them. The light shone upon us at God's providential time. Amen. So I mean, it, it, it's easy to understand the shepherd's next response. Mm -hmm. The next response was they were terrified. They are all of them sitting in darkness. They are in a desert place. And all of a sudden, light shines. Yes. It's enough to make anybody jittery. Mm -hmm. They're watching their, their flock because that's their job. Mm -hmm. They are awake, so make sure no robbers, and no beasts, no wolves. So they're sitting there, fighting sleep, fighting drowsiness, fighting to stay awake. And then suddenly, the sky lights up like the noonday sun. Jesus. <clears throat> and a man who had not been there seconds before is instantly standing before them. Brilliant in his appearance. Glory shining all around him. Yeah, there's instant terror. They're terrified. The Greek word says they could almost go out their mind. They're shocked. It's much the same when God fashions his light upon our mind. We're sitting in darkness of sin. May have been a little spooky. But it was tolerable. Suddenly the glory of God's absolute holiness begins to shine into our sin-blackened heart. And we realize with the prophet Isaiah, when he got a vision of God, Woe is me, Isaiah said, for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean living. In other words, when God's glory shone upon him, he saw his sinfulness. When God's word shone upon us, we saw ourselves as we really were. Sinners in need of God. But thankfully, God in his tender mercy doesn't leave us there. He doesn't leave us in that terrifying situation. What did the angel immediately speak to these shepherds? He spoke words of comfort and joy. He says, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news. Of great joy, which was the line that John Newton penned when he said, "'Twas grace that caused my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed." The intensity of the sequence of these events, they vary from person to person. But as we grow in our walk with God, the awareness of the utter blackness of our hearts, the understanding how sin had a grip on us, the binding intensity of our inability to relate to God and approach God, and how God has made his interest. 
entrance into our lives by bringing us the word of God and the value of that. It goes beyond our understanding and comprehension. Why me? Oh Lord, thank you, Jesus. Mm. It's because we're God's choice. Mm -hmm. Why do you shepherds? Mm. Thank you. Because God's choice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Number five, here we go. The good news about Christ the Savior requires a personal response. A personal response. Now, notice what the shepherds did do. The shepherds doesn't hear this great news and then they sit around the campfire discussing it. Did you see that? Did you hear what I think we heard? <laughs> They didn't send a delegation to uh, 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 to the rabbis in Jerusalem to get their view of things. They didn't say we 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 almost believe. After all, we know a little bit about scripture. We know a little bit about the Old Testament that a Messiah was supposed to be born. That was prophesied. Amen. Thanks for telling us that, but uh, 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 there was no doubt. The text says, if you got your Bible, yeah. if you got your Bible open, I want you to notice here. It says, when the angel had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem. Let us go straight to Bethlehem. Leave the sheep. Remember, why are they there at night? Leave the sheep alone. Wow. Who's going to watch and make sure no robbers come? It ain't our business. We just heard from heaven. We got to go straight. No detour. Let us go straight to Bethlehem. Then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. God opened up their eyes and they see. They got to make a beeline to where the prophecy had come from. Now, I want you to notice several things about this. I want you to know, number one, their response is of faith. Although the text does not explicitly say that the shepherds responded by faith, their actions tell us that they responded by faith. They obviously believe the words of the angel. Or they would not have left their sheep and gone to bed. They would not have left their sheep. Now, now you got to understand this. They leave their sheep for three days. Wow. They make a 90 mile trip. 180 miles round trip. To go and to confirm a word from an angel. It wasn't a two-hour trip. It was a three-day journey. They leave their flock. Three days. Wow, because of an angel came and appeared to them in such a setting, then they knew that this heavenly host could protect their sheep while they were going on God's business. Yes, yes, yes. They respond in faith. Yes. And what did they see when they get to Bethlehem? Did they see a, a kingly child arrayed in, arrayed in royal robes and a golden cradle with servants attending to him? Did this child mother have a halos over their head? Not quite. What did they see? They saw a common couple from Nazareth in a very primitive, odd stable and a normal looking newborn baby. It wasn't exactly the way that you would expect God to bring his anointed Savior into this world. But the shepherds view this baby with the eyes of faith. I want you to see this. A word from God may not come in an unexpected package. It may not come in a package that spells from God. It may not come with a halo on it as we get packages from Amazon that got the little smile and the arrow on it. Y'all ain't, ain't getting this. Amen, amen, amen. They hear a word from God 
They know a little prophecy and they go and they find a common looking couple with a common looking baby. But their faith is not in what they see. Their faith is in what they heard. Their faith is in the word that they receive. They take this baby with eyes of faith. It's a normal looking child. A normal looking couple. But what did the word, what did the angel just told you three days ago? Don't go by what you see. Go by what you heard. So they operate in faith in accordance with the word of God that was given to them through the angel. And when Christ is revealed to your soul, when Christ is revealed to us, saints, we got to respond with eyes of faith. Amen. We got to respond with eyes of faith. Amen. Stop taking time to debate over it, think about it, or pray over it. Amen. When God in His Word unfolds to us where we are and what we need to adjust and what we need to do, we have to respond with faith, trusting God. It may not look like it's going to turn out. It may not look like it's going to come together, but I got to operate with faith because it's in God's word. Amen. Jesus may not be the kind of savior you expect. May not be the kind of savior that you hear over the media. But you got to take him from what you see in the word. They responded in faith. We got to respond in faith. Here's the second response. They respond with proclamation. They respond with proclamation. They respond with proclamation. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. They made known the statement which had been told them about the child. It, and what was the news? It's great news of great joy which shall be for all people. The shepherds didn't stop to think about how people might respond because somebody going to say they're crazy. <laughs> somebody have said, a bunch of angels, you saw this, and you going to leave your job <laughs> to go find something that you say have. I was looking up in the sky and I didn't see anything. You heard what? And all of a sudden it disappeared. All right. <laughs> Crazy. That didn't stop these men from relating their story. I want you to know something. Once you have seen the Savior for yourself, <laughs> once you have experienced the Savior with eyes of faith, Amen. you cannot let nothing and no one stop you from telling <laughs> others about the good news. Amen. You got some good news this year to tell somebody. Yes. Amen. Not only how he brought you through, not only how he kept you, but he's still the Savior. He's still saving. He's still putting lives together. He's yet the healer. He's yet the deliverer. Yes. We got some work to do. Yes. We got some work to do. It's time out for us sitting and wandering in our own stupor. Mm -hmm. We got to tell somebody, yes, somebody that Jesus is alive. Yes. So, so they respond in prayer. They respond in faith. They respond in a proclamation. And then let us see. They respond in praise. Notice what verse 20 says. The shepherds went back glorifying and praising God. They went glorifying and they went back praising God. And God has taken you from darkness of our sins by his grace. And when he has revealed to us what the Savior has done, our hearts should be filled with praise and glory. Amen. As the Apostle Paul would put it, Apostle Paul said, believers should be joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. I wanted to preach this yesterday. This is one of the texts I wanted to preach yesterday, but I knew that my audience would not get it. And I was going to use for a title, 
her last will and testament. And I knew that some in the audience would misinterpret that as being, I'm reading the will. But you got to understand, for a saint, our will and testament is different from what's filed away with the government. Notice what Paul says here in Colossians chapter 1, verse 11 and 13. Believers should be joyously giving thanks to the Father. Why? Because he has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. For what? He delivered us from the domain of darkness. And what else did he do? He transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. And what about the son? In whom we have the forgiveness of sin. The forgiveness of our sin is attached to Jesus. Amen. And those who hear and see God's good news should respond with faith. We should respond with proclamation. And we should respond in prayer. Notice these two words. They were glorifying and praising. Those are not synonymous. They were putting God display and they were giving God word. Yes, yes. All that we do got to put God on display. It ain't got nothing to do with you and I. Amen. We don't elevate ourselves. Every time we come to this room, it's to put God on display. It's to elevate him. It's all about him. Amen. Amen. Our scripture readings point us to God. Yes. Our songs point us to God. Yes. Our fellowship point us to yes. God. Hallelujah. Yes. We give him his proper accolade. God is just good. I don't like all the time. I just like he's good. He's just good. He's just good. See, well, sometimes when I hear God is good all the time, there's a time, there's a time element. But see, the bottom line is God is just good. Goodness is in is a characteristic yes. of God. In other words, there is never a time when God is not good. Yes. There's never an occasion. Now, I know we think that God is good all the time and all the time God is good. And I know we think back with all the time God is good, but it's still got that word time. We got that chaos time element in there. I just simply like, God is good. God is good. Because that is the inherent character of God. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. So we are good sometimes. <laughs> and sometimes we're not. Amen. So, so we can't say Jake is good. Now, now the one thing that we can say about Jake, we can say Jake is, we can say Jake is a sinner. Oh, you're looking at me strange. Because I didn't give the other phrase. Jake is a sinner saved by grace. As long as I'm here in this earth realm, there's never a time that I am separated from this body suit which represents sin. Wow. As long as I'm encased in this body that was born and shaped in sin, I'm a sinner. Jeez. But by the grace of God, I don't yield to the temptation of sin on a regular basis. Because there's a power within this body suit that's been born and shaped in sin that's greater and bigger than my propensity to sin. Now sometimes I go outside of that propensity and say, y'all ain't talking like some common people here. Y'all, 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 y'all good all your little lives. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Sometimes we go outside of that petition and we see. But because of the power that works on the inside, the only thing I got to do is come back to the cross. And because my name is written in the Lamb of the Light, that sin has already been taken care of. So I got to glorify him. And I got to give him some praise. Don't glorify God and give God praise because of music. You're, you're, you're missing saints while we're, one of the reasons why we're here. We don't have the choir no more to 
to, to penalize you to, to be, come on, come on, y'all know how we used to be over there at Rock Bridge and, and singers get up there and you would be screaming and hollering, come on, the music was off the chain. Yes, it was. But sometimes it would cause us to wonder, are we praising because of the okay. music? Amen. Or are we praising because we know God? Like Your praise now got to be because you hey, know God. Amen. Amen. Yes, Lord. Even when my wife was over the other day messing up the music, it didn't mess up my praise. All right. Amen. Because my praise was not connected to her cutting the song off short. Right. I was praising God because of the words, and I can continue to praise yeah. God. This is a time for us to grow deeper in our maturity yes. in the Lord. Yes. So when God does open up the door and allow things to be as they may have been in times past, our worship will be much deeper and much more intense because now we have grown out of being moved by the external and now we have an internal reason to pray. Which will bring authenticity to our praise. So they come with praise. Let's, let's, let's finish this. And then, they, and then the response is of endurance. The text says they went back. They went back. Think about this, Elder Andrew. They went back. Went back where? Did they go back to appear on TVN? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Huh? Uh-oh. The, the entertainment world is making much ado about Brother West conversion. Oh, y'all know him. Y'all know yes, what I'm talking about. Yeah. The entertainment world and much of the Christian world is making much ado about his conversion. Some are saying it's very genuine. Others are saying it's not. The bottom line is it's not for us to question. Amen. God knows. Yes, he does. But I want to tell you something. When you get genuinely saved, mm -hmm. the first place you ain't going is on the stage. Oh, uh -huh. Not right now. Yeah. First place you're going is at the feet of Jesus. Amen. Oh, yeah. Amen. You're going to be a Mary, and you're going to fall at the feet of Jesus, right. and you're going to worship, and you're going to learn something about Jesus. That's right. Amen. Where did they go? They didn't go and go on a book tour. Now, they ain't writing a book. Now, they could have wrote a bestseller. Mm -hmm. The night the angels appeared. <laughs> <laughs> They could, they could write a musical. The Shepherd's Vision. They could have become famous. No, where did they go? They went right back to sheep. They went right back to the jobs. They went right back to their lowly jobs. Now for some, that's kind of a letdown. After the great things they saw, after the great things they heard, they go right back to the routine job that they had left three days prior. They didn't set up no tours of, Drew, of Bethlehem. Let's go into Bethlehem and tell everybody what we saw and heard. They didn't put on no seminars on how you can see visions of angels. They went back to their job. But they, but they went back differently than they came. They didn't come glorifying and praising God, but they go back. Glorifying and praising God. Now, get, the, get what the promise, get what the praising and glorifying God is connected to. The glorifying and praising God is connected to because of what they heard and what they saw. They heard something and what they saw validated what they heard. And once they saw the two meet, they glorified and praised God. Amen. God doesn't call us to the spectacular. God doesn't call us to the flashy, constant, exciting life. He calls us to believe in the Savior. And then believing in the Savior, he sends us back into the routine of life. And learn how to glorify him and learn how to rejoice in him and learn how to make that glorifying and praising him to be known among all people. He sends us back. This is what these shepherds did. They respond with proclamation. They respond in praise. And they respond in endurance. My conclusion say a man traveled a great distance for an interview with a distinguished scholar. He 
he was ushered into the man's study where he said, Doctor, I noticed that the walls of your study are lined with books from the ceiling to the floor. No doubt you have read them all. I know you have written many yourself. You have traveled extensively and doubtlessly you've had the privilege of conversing with some of the world's wisest men. I've come a long ways to ask you just one question. Tell me, of all you've learned, was the one thing most worth knowing. Putting his hand on the guest's shoulder, the scholar replied with emotion in his voice, my dear son, all the things I've learned, only two are really worth knowing. The first is, I am a great sinner, and the second is, that Jesus Christ is a great Savior. And if you know those two things, I know just a few minutes ago I said, when I made the statement, I'm a sinner. I know that. But I'm so grateful for Jesus. I'm so grateful for my relationship with Jesus. If you know these two personal things, then you know the best news in the whole world. Thank you, Lord. The Savior has been born for you, who is Christ. Who is Christ? Praise the Lord. The Lord. Amen. 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 Bow your heads with me in prayer. <laughs> Father, thank you for this passage of Scripture today. Thank you for the songs of the angels. I pray, Lord God, that as we visit these passages of Scripture, the, the recounting of these passages will renew our faith, will renew our hope in you. <coughs> God, we've heard these stories so many times. We've read them so many times. The bring of newness, a, a freshness to these passages of Scripture. Give us new insight. Help us to live out these truths during this most precious of holidays. God, I pray that as we hear your word, may we apply it as you have spoken, given us principles, that you have challenged us today. May we not take for granted, Lord God, the great salvation that has been provided for us in your Son, Jesus. And Lord God, may we not take that lightly. May we not look at ourselves as being more than we really are. May we be honest about our shortcomings and, and where we are missing it and bring it to you because you already know. But we need to confess it for our own sake. God, may we bring it to you and speak openly and honestly, knowing that you have already provided for us a way of escape. So Lord, I thank you for your word again. I thank you for these hearers. I thank you for these who have ears to hear. Pray that as we leave this room today and get ready for another week of challenging work, God, I pray that the good news will be seen in how we carry ourselves and what we say and give us an opportunity to share with somebody the reason for this season. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.